This Tibet House video was originally recorded at Menlo Retreat in Phoenicia, New York, March 2017. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menlo.us. Birthing the creative product 
that moves through all artists, again, of all types. <clears throat> so, and the truth is, we're all artists, right? You know, mm -hmm. some of us, some of us are, um, you know, better with a paintbrush and or a piano than others. But we are all artists, and we're all um, creating a life. And it's amazing that we get to do that, you know? It's, it's amazing that we get to, to have the, the art, this free, art, you know, free will in artistic expression. And one of the things that I see as a, deaf, uh, as a therapist, one, of, one thing you don't, I mean, maybe you know this about me, but I developed a spiritual counseling process called Deaf Hypnosis. And in that spiritual counseling process, one of the things that I love to do is to help people remove their internal obstacles to being able to bring forth their gifts into the world. Um, we were fortunate enough to live in um, a society for the time being um, that allows us to have freedom of artistic expression and I think we can't underestimate how valuable that is. But one of the things that happens is that we find our own internal obstacles, our own our ways in which we don't understand what our relationship is to that creative force that moves through us or where we don't know how to cultivate it and to um, nurture it properly. So that's one of the things several of you mentioned it in the in the in the introduction that you know you have this conflicted relationship or this kind of difficult relationship with your own mothers, um, and that can actually be very informative to what your relationship with the, the great mother is, the great feminine is, and uh, it can offer you a place to look where you can find any the the difficulties that we have in relationship with our mothers or women in general will often point to the places where we have obstacles to the great feminine itself and um, so uh, that's one of the things that I've seen in my depth hypnosis practice is that it's uh, totally possible to remove um, the internal obstacles that arise in our relationship with our mothers or with other women you find for, especially for men often men think they have to go through a woman in order to access the great feminine and they can get kind of tumbled in that process and you know, certainly my, my goal is to help the men who are here establish your own relationship with the Great Feminine, to not feel that, you know, you have to be uh, connected to a woman in order to access it. And um, ultimately, I actually think that the experience of the Great Feminine is not simply female. You know, it's, the, it's this great generative, creative process that happens to be the purview of women these days, because women's bodies do this thing where they bring forward this child, and you know it's very clear to see the the way in which a woman's body is aligned with the earth and the celestial spheres and you know the the processes of creation. But um, you know that's you know that it's just that's sort of just uh, one place to go to to learn about this great generativity of the Great Mother. And I think that it, this is a process that all beings, male, female, can participate in and can improve the world by participating in. So um, we're going to be focusing on these creative processes. And we're also going to learn what it means to dedicate the power and the fruits of our own creative endeavor to the earth, to the Great Mother, and how this may change our understanding of the purpose of our lives and the intention with which we lead them. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be uh, working in the class. Bob is going to be bringing forward the expression of the Great Feminine in Buddhism, the Prashna Paramita, and um, the uh, the teachings on emptiness, and um, <clears throat> he's going to um, help us really establish a deeper connection with that 
uh, great and effable field of experience of that emptiness points to that is highly creative in, in, in its nature. And um, we're going to also uh, establish a connection with the Great Mother through meditation. <clears throat> and we're going to be looking at the processes of initiation. Because all great um, mysteries have, have gates that are posted um, as you approach the mystery. And initiations are, you can think of them kind of as tests or uh, the processes of gathering the amount of power that you need in order to approach the, the mystery itself. And so we're going to be looking at the process of initiation and understanding what that is. And we're going to also look at the nature of the creative portal. As I said, this is an exploration of creativity. And one of the things that um, we often don't understand as creative people, as people who are creating our lives, we, we don't understand that, that we are actually bringing forth something that it's coming through us, and it's coming through us through a, a portal which opens between ordinary reality and non-ordinary reality. And our task is to become as clear a conduit for that which is coming through the portal. And in order to do that, you have to understand the nature of the portal, its requirements, and um, what um, what is required of us in order to be able to work with the portal effectively. And so we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, helping, helping you understand how to manage your own creative portals better, how to heal your relationship or to improve your relationship with your, the creative portals in your life. And we're also going to look at what it means to devote ourselves, to dedicate ourselves to to the the to yourself to the creative impulse that is you you know how how do you dedicate yourself to yourself as fully as you can what what does this mean and you know and how in how what does it look like when you dedicate yourself to your own creative processes what does this mean about your dedication to the great mother you know this this is the way we serve her and um, it's a wonderful enterprise, right? So, um, so I'd like to um, just talk a little bit about different cultures that have had strong, um, strong connections with the great feminine uh, through the goddesses that um, exist in those cultures, and. Um, uh, I'd like to just kind of take a tour of the, the geography of, of the world and just mention some of the goddesses that have, and what they have been seen to embody in these different, um, in these different places. So of course we have Isis, who is one of the great goddesses of any culture. She is um, uh, the, one of the most important deities of ancient, Euro ancient Egypt. And she, as many goddesses do in their cultural environment, she held many different roles. And um, she is connected, uh, very strongly connected with the rites of the dead. But she was also a, a healer and a very important arbiter of fertility rites. And this, you know, this is very typical. The goddesses in most of their cultural environments do um, do rule the birthing, the dying, and the alchemy of, of, of life. And uh, she's no exception. And of course we have uh, Durga, very important Hindu goddess, who was actually you know, the, the goddess of the universe, and was the, you know, the and still is, the, this, uh, the, this, you know, the, the creator of the universe, and 
you know, uh, one who can meet any of the forces that would go against the processes of creation with great force and ferocity. And we also have a similar figure in China with Nu Gua, who um, is also a very ferocious goddess who is uh, kind of faces down any kind of challenge to um, any kind of process that would um, not allow for the participation of creativity in, in the world. And um, she was also, um, in, in the culture of China, she was also um, sort of the arbiter of, you know, who got to marry who. She was kind of like a matchmaker. So she was kind of in charge of creating family systems and uh, sort of dictating how they went. And of course, we have Gaia, the ancient Greek goddess, <clears throat> who is, um, you know, the spirit of the beautiful earth and who, um, you know, who has, uh, you know, this, this embracing and, and nourishing quality. And then we have uh, <clears throat> Kuatalukwe, who is one of the three expressions of the Aztec goddesses of, um, that often appear as, as snakes and serpents and um, they all have, between the three of them, they manage birth, death, and alchemy. And then we have Nisan Nisan, the lady of the wild cow, which is a Sumerian deity. And, um, you know, I have just recently been thinking about why cows are such important embodiments of goddesses in many different cultures you find this mm -hmm. and i have i have a theory and i'll, I'll present it later but uh <laughs> i think it's a pretty big theory uh, but I, I don't know if i'm right or not it has to do with cow manure <laughs> cow manure oh. and things that grow in cow manure mm -hmm. such as psilocybin mushrooms So I think that I think that there's uh, a connection. I think that um, because when you when you know uh, when you ingest psilocybin, of course, you become very much connected to the processes of creativity and regeneration. And uh, and uh, I mean, some people feel like they're being destroyed by them, but that's because they need to be broken down in order to create. That's all. Um, so, um, so anyway, there's, oh, there you are, I gave you my theory, but. <laughs> and then um, in West Africa, there is Asasa Ya'a, who is uh, considered again to be the mother of earth. She's a fertility goddess and the upholder of truth. And then in, uh, of course, in Irish mythology, we have Danu who is, again, a fertility goddess, and also she's the goddess of the wind, which I think is, you know, especially here at Menla, if you spend any amount of time listening to the wind, <laughs> there is something going on in the wind, right? Um, and of course we have Artemis, um, who was, uh, you know, the Greek equivalent of Athena, these warrior goddesses that are often uh, depicted uh, as, uh, heading out to the hunt. And uh, then we have uh, Frigga, who is uh, the wife of Odin in the Scandinavian uh, Scandinavian tales or folk or Norse mythology. And she's associated primarily with the hearth and with childbirth. And so, you know, we have these, you know, in so many cultures around the world, we have very clearly articulated embodiments of the great feminine, and um, and you know people have in those cultures have a definite relationship to the great feminine uh, through these goddesses. And one of the things that has happened in the current environment, of course, is that we don't have you know strong uh, like a strong mythology of the great feminine that is sort of at the centerpiece of, of, the, of the culture. And 
because of the way in which many of us has, have lost connection with the earth, we don't have an easy way back to her, which is why it's so important to take a moment, as the moment we're taking this weekend, to, to reconnect. And again, we have this beautiful portal of Menla, this beautiful earth that we can move back toward the goddess through and, uh, and reclaim those powers, her powers, in our lives. So that's what we're going to be doing here this weekend. That's the overview. That's the overview. That's great. So, uh, we all have this uh, sheet of paper. Uh -huh. And uh, you uh, try to keep it, uh, you know, between the sessions, because we'll open the sessions with this sheet of paper. Uh, this is something known as the Heart Sutra in Buddhism. And in all, for in all forms of Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, universal vehicle and in Zen and in Tibetan Buddhism, etc. And uh, at the beginning of all kinds of rituals or teachings and things, they chant this. Uh, there's a shorter version, longer version, in one language or another. And uh, so we'll read it together. And then I'll make a little commentary to introduce it without introducing it. We'll just read it all together. We're not going to make any kind of highly technical chant. We'll just we'll read it a little slowly, like we're sending it out into the, into the universe. OK? But let me, and let me say, in, in preface, in relation to what the overview of that is again, Pragya Karamita, this is the name of it, and the word Bhagavati. Bhagavati means a goddess. It's the usual, the male form is Bhagavata. And so, but Bhagavati is a female form, and it's the name of Buddha. And uh, completely perfectly in life and being, we will be discussing what that means. And uh, beyond male and female, actually, it's uh, either male or female, depending on the content. Pranya means intelligence at the most basic level, sharp intelligence. The G N Y A. Yeah, is the same in English as the kno, in, to kno something, you know, we kno things. We <laughs> don't pronounce the K, but the kno thing. It's from the Greek, you know, gnosis. So it's the same in Sanskrit, actually, this kinya thing, to know. And pra means to know, like super know, meaning to know something so fully that you and the thing that you know kind of become one thing. And paramita means the transcendent, you know, the, a, a super intelligence that has gone beyond. And uh, the Bhagavati Pranya Paramita is said to be the mother of all Buddhas, because no sentient being, male or female, can become a Buddha without becoming Pranya Paramita, you know, understanding completely the nature of well, everything. Pranya Paramita in itself, other, etc. And, um, and so Hrdaya, the last word is the Sanskrit title, Hrdaya means heart. Hrdaya, um, like it. So it's very similar to the English word heart. Hrdaya. Okay? So let's read it together. Okay? Just follow along with me. In Sanskrit, Bhagavati Pranya Paramita Hrdaya. Everyone can read. In Tibetan, Chongzhen Dema Shiva Parchin Ningbo. In English, the Blessed Lady Buddha, part of transcendent wisdom. Thus did I hear on a special occasion the Blessed Lord as well as the most repeat the Padma together with great communities of Indians and Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching of Samadhi Paul, the illumination of the profound. Just then, the noble Bodhisattva, Allah Bhattishvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, and he realized that those five body-mind processes are void of any intrinsic reality. 
and then the clapping just seals that. It's like, you know, it's like uh, the, the clapping is not a, an applause thing in Tibetan culture. It's, a, it's an effort to drive something away. So when the British invaded Tibet in 1904, they killed a lot of Tibetans who didn't have guns and guns. And they marched into Lhasa. All the Tibetans were clapping. So they were surprised that they were being applauded. It was the last defense. <laughs> so uh, there's a few things in commentary. So um, you know, first of all, the Buddha, and, the, and this is the longer version of the Heart Sutra. There are 18 different versions of the Sutra, a hundred thousand line version and one syllable version. So this is sort of one of the short ones, but it's not the super short. <laughs> so it's the one that's just one syllable. And um, uh, it's in honor of the female Buddha because she is Pratyaparamita, the transcendent wisdom. So transcendent wisdom, even any male person who wants to attain understanding of the nature of reality, enlightenment, they have to merge with the Great Mother, in other words, to do it. That is the Great Mother. The Great, the great Mother, the Great Feminine is wisdom, according to Buddha's view. So Buddha himself doesn't teach this which is very interesting. He does teach other parts of our transcendent wisdom sutra. But this one, he goes into a samadhi, which means sort of a deep state, where um, he, his field, he creates a field around him of this illumination of the profound, profound means sort of the deepest, truest, ultimate nature of reality. It's the sort of profound, you know, not the superficial uh, surface of reality, but the deep nature of what it really is. That the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, Ishvara of that name means God, and Avalokita means who looks with loving care. Avalokita means. So the concept of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara is that with God, who is not just I'm, I'm the great God, you know, up above everything, but he's the God who's worrying about all the beings, and he's therefore considered to be the incarnation of the compassion, universal compassion meaning the universal wish to heal the suffering of all beings, uh, of all Buddhas. So in a way, although he's a Bodhisattva, meaning a hero of enlightenment rather than a full Buddha, he in a way is beyond that Buddha. He's a Buddha, he can fully enlighten, and then he wanted to be more like one of the seeking beings. And so he became a Bodhisattva to be more close to the beings. And the great hero is, uh, is, is means like a savior. Messiah kind of person, and that you save beings, that's his thing. So he was contemplating it, and when he contemplated it, he realized that his body, you know, these five body-mind processes, one of them is the physical process of the body, then down here you see this other list, you have sensations, mm -hmm. conceptions, mental functions, which include emotions and other things, and consciousnesses. So those are the five processes that Buddhism uses. It's just a, it's like a map of your body-mind complex, but uh, in varying degrees of subtlety. They're sort of, they consider when you meditate to search through yourself, to do a scan of what, you, what your process actually is. But it's very useful to see yourself as a process of physical process, a process of sensations, pleasure, pain, numbness. A process of ideas, you know, which you have inside. Like, for example, if I think about my hand right now, right now I sort of put my mind in my hand. But you know, you can't really put your mind in your hand. You know? Your hand is in your hand. You know? But I can sort of think of as if I'm sort of attentive to what my hand is feeling, you know, like the, the breeze on the skin, any kind of feeling inside it, like you know, a little soreness from working or something. Uh, and, but that's because I have an idea of my hand. So in a way, I'm putting my mind through the lens of the idea of a hand and thinking and sort of trying to inhabit my hand. Do you follow me? So that idea, we have all this may, huge process of many, many mental images and ideas and, and thoughts and pictures. And that's the conception process. And then there's the mental function process, which includes all kinds of you know, emotions, positive ones, negative ones, 
uh, plus deeper things like a sense of up and down, a sense of space, of balance, of, of direction, you know, the, all those kind of mental functions and emotions and willpower, you know. And then finally, consciousnesses, you know, we sometimes think we have a unitary kind of consciousness, but if we really look at our consciousness, we find that, you know, our consciousness is focusing on things we're looking at, visual consciousness, or what we're hearing, or smelling, or tasting, or touching, or imagining in our inner realm of ideas and concepts. So consciousness is quite a complicated bunch of processes. Anyway, he looked at those all of those five levels of subtlety of his being, he's pretty many, he was complimenting them. And then he realized that none of them, they were all empty of any intrinsic reality. This is a key concept. Like when you and I look at the floor, and I'm just assuming we're all, you are equally as unenlightened as me. So, but therefore I'm just saying you and I, but in case you're enlightened, don't be fit. So, <laughs> you and I are looking at the floor, and we see, and you know, the word floor perhaps about hops up, you know, in our mind, floor, like it was like, come out of the floor, floor. Or if we know other languages, we'll have, we'll have other words for it. And so uh, we assume that there's kind of a, an, some kind of a reality of the floor that is a real floor. And the word floor, or our concept of floor, that recognizes it, it sort of lands on the referent of that word, you know, like there's a real thing there. You know, like Plato thought that things are instances of the sort of divine idea of the thing, you know, and that was the essence of the thing, you know, the floorness of the floor is what makes it a floor, this kind of thing. A lot of philosophers have come up with ideas like that, and which reflects the fact that in our habit, we kind of, we have a concept of things, we learn words and languages, we navigate around, you know, oh, there's a person, there's a knee, there's a pillow, there's a floor. And then we kind of distribute those concepts out into the things. And we think the things really correspond to our notions of the things. Do you follow me? And that's called the, the, our sort of uh, assumption, which the Buddhists say we can discover is a false assumption. But our assumption that things have an intrinsic reality. That is a reality that's within the thing itself. It's not a reality that's just attributed to it. You follow me? It's not just a relative reality. It's a reality of the, that really is the inside the thing, you know, the floorness of the thing. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So in ancient time, people would have wars with people who spoke other languages. Because they'd come in and they'd be not in a house, they'd be in a casa. You know? <laughs> oh, that's terrible. You know? <laughs> and then you're going, yeah, this is a house, it's not a casa. What do you mean, casa? You know? In other words, they actually would have wars, and, and still religious wars. Allah, Yahweh, Yahweh, Baruch, Adonai, you know, they'll kill each other over these different names, right? So, but the point is, whatever the force of the universe is, it's not really attached to this or that name. There's no intrinsic name in the thing, if you follow me. So I want to look at this where I recognize that. He recognized the true nature of things which he called voidness or emptiness. But actually what that means is that there's nothing in the floor that is not related to our interaction with the floor, the atoms in the floor interacting with the floor, the subatomic energies in the floor, the ground under the floor, the foundation, the things on it, the boards that are stuck on it, etc. In other words, it's totally relational. There's nothing non-relational. It's empty of any non-relational core intrinsic reality. Do you follow me? And similarly, ourselves, like I go around thinking, I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm really Bob. I'm not even I'm Bob. I'm, I'm, I'm the real Bob. Some of your names I didn't hear when you were introducing it. I'm Evan. I'm the real Evan. Evan, I'm Evan. He's not Evan. I'm Evan. So we have this sense that the self if there's a, we go to seminars and find out your true identity. <laughs> we'll be a seminar to learn your real identity. But identity means, Latin idea means the same thing. So identity means the same thing. So identity reflects our habit that there's something inside us that never changes. That's the real us. An intrinsically real self. The Buddha had this famous teaching called self -reflection. 
it doesn't mean that people don't exist at all. It just means that people are fluid, changeable, form constantly changing processes. And they do have relative identities. You know, I am Bob but I have a driver's license. He says it's very hard, so I'm right. And, and they do. I can mean, change it. I can go change your name. You know, in other words, Identity, identification process is itself empty of being some fixed thing. And enlightenment involves being able to recognize your interwovenness and relativity completely without some kind of holding back that there's some absolute me that's not connected. It's sort of problematic, my version. And also the other is something absolutely different from me. And the ground is different from me and this and that, which is sort of the human habit. And from Buddhist point of view, it's a sickness, actually. It's the source of our suffering. So, so that's what he realized. And then he, and, then, and it's a shock. Now, now, a lot of people have misunderstood that in history as meaning that the reality is some sort of empty space, and all these things here are illusory. A lot of spiritual and mystical people have wrongly understood this, even in Buddhism and in other religions as well, other traditions as well. And then just like materialism today, misunderstands it. They think the underlying reality and everything is nothingness, right? Existentialist and material. They think that if you, because it's sort of logical, right? If you took everything apart, you know, you threw it all in an atom smasher out there and spits all over something and then it all ground up and exploding and so uh, it would all disappear. And what would be left would be that sort of blank, dark space that we think of as nothingness, right? Similarly, every night you fall asleep. Close your eyes, you know, shut your ears, you know, put air blocks, whatever, it's not me. And you lose consciousness. And you go into a space of darkness and sort of seeming nothingness. So we sort of assume that that's what, the, that's what the base of reality is. And of course, the materialists are expecting to go there when they die. Right? No, they'll just be happily oblivious and forever. So even if they blew up nuclear weapons, they took away your soul. They won't care once they're dead. <laughs> what they did. So, so that's a, that's a kind of mistake that people make. You know, actually, nothing. Nothing. Great thing about nothing is that it's nothing. That's a really cool thing about it. It's not there. It doesn't exist. You just didn't find something if you're looking, and you say, "Oh yeah, there's nothing here." But it, it, nothing isn't. You just didn't find what the something you were looking for. Has. Nothing itself is not here. So emptiness does not mean that, although sometimes a space is used to give an idea of what emptiness is, like an analogy or a simile, but actually emptiness just means the total relativity of it. It's the ancient experiential, if you will, experimental scientific discovery of relativity that we're all interrelated. And, um, and that is the wisdom of the, of the great mother in the first point of view, the total interrelatedness of it. Because once you recognize the total interrelatedness of it, then you can swim in it effectively. And also, other people's pain is somehow connected to your pain. Other people's happiness is connected to your happiness. Your happiness is connected to their happiness. So then you can come around to recognizing the purpose of life. You know? One time I was thinking when you were talking that I had a conversation once at lunch with a very nice man called Jean Jacques Arnaud, who was the movie director, a movie director. And he made the Seven Years in Tibet movie, among other things. He made movies about bears and whales, and he's French, you know, Jean Jacques Arnaud. And I asked him, I said, Why did you make this movie about this German guy going to Tibet and talking to the young Dalai Lama and whatever, and about the Dalai Lama? Chinese don't like it, why did you make that? He said, well, I opened this book about the Dalai Lama and it blew my mind. I said, why? He said, on the first page it said, well, of course, everyone knows that the purpose of life is happiness. And then he said it was such a shock to him <laughs> that someone, great spiritual leader, would say that just like straight off out of the blue. I mean, you know, everybody wants, they want to be happy, they don't want to suffer. It's like really you know, it's not the rocket science. <laughs> you, you, you all came here among other purposes. You, you thought maybe it would improve your happiness. You like contact the great mother. 
you know, to realize you are in the Great Mother. The great Mother's all around. So, so anyway, and then there are other things in here which I won't go into detail about, are all kinds of sets of concepts that have to do with sort of Buddhist descriptions of reality. And, um, and they reflect in the sort of no I know your thing. That like, for example, the nose is the one I like. No eye, no ear, no nose. That's my favorite one. No nose. This is a good one for you. It's for your practice. It's an exercise for your homework exercise. Try to find your nose. You think you can easily find it. But if you really make a thought experiment, really meditate about your nose, you realize that everything you touch, if you take your fingertip and go around like dabbing on your nose, Every little piece that you touch is actually not your nose. It could be removed. You know, you have an accident, you go to a plastic surgeon, and you'd still have a nose. But at the moment, it seems to be part of the nose. But in a way, you, since you, then you, you can't really find the boundary between your nose and your cheek, or your upper lip, or your forehead, or the nose and the air inside the nostril. Is that, is that part of the nose, uh, according to what? And if you took a microscope and looked at the skin, which would make your pores look like the Grand Canyon, <laughs> then you would wonder, where's the surface of the nose, even? If you go to the atom level of the nose, then, right, the atom model is mostly there's an electron and the thing, and it's mostly empty space with some atoms buzzing around. If you go to the subatomic quantum level, then it will completely disappear your nose. So in a way, of course your nose is there. I like to say it's your lifelong hood ornament. <laughs> cruising ahead of you as you go ahead in life. But if you really look for the nose, like, absolutely, what's my, where's my nose, like intrinsically real, the real nose, it will dissolve under your analysis, you follow me? So the reason he says, no, I know you're going to nose later there, is that he's in this mood of seeing through everything. Because he's, he's done a thought experiment that has become combined with a very high level of meditative concentration. Where actually he's sort of just seen it all disappear, if you if you will. He's had an experience of it all disappearing, experienced himself disappearing, not been frightened because he knew very well that nothingness doesn't have to disappear because nothingness was never there, my friend. That's just, that really makes it safe. It's <laughs> always something else. And uh, then so then the, the mantra reflects that experience. Gate is, is, is the past passive participle of the verb to go. So it means gone. So gate, gate means gone, gone. Paragate, para is like pra, it means very, super, super gone. Parasamgate means super totally gone. Some means completely gone, super totally gone. And then bodhi means enlightenment, you know, total awareness, total for knowledge of reality. And swaha means all hail, or all is well, or everything is great. Okay, so that mantra reflects that experience of freedom, actually. That's what it is. It's an experience of freedom, which is the heart of, the essence of, the Great Mother. And um, so that is her heart, really, is the mantra. Yeah? And uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the reason we chant it. And, and um, and then there's a second point to make here, right, which I want to make right away, which is that when Buddha himself initially, or any of the people, millions of people in thousands of years who have become fully enlightened, not just have a little like light bulb pop off in their head or become a little bit more smart about things, but fully enlightened, meaning completely understanding of themselves and everything else, including the Great Mother, the Great Father, the Earth, the water, the fire, the wind, the whole thing. The subatomic uh, energy, the wave particle, paraphrase, what have you. Um, when, um, when that happened, whenever that happens, this recognition of emptiness and relativity is how it's expressed. But you know, then you, there could be this problem if all things are totally relative then maybe there's no way of escaping from the totally relative. And maybe there's a lot of bad stuff in the relative, right? So if someone understood completely the nature of things, the danger might be that they would say, oh, oh, is that how it is? That's terrible. Oh, I, it, I know people don't even want to know that. And they would shrink away from it. And they would say, ignorance is bliss.
this. And they would say, I just think, you know, you're going to have a good time. And they go, like, how are you going to do it? Eat a chocolate, whatever that thing is called. <laughs> In other words, just eat stuff because there's no way out of it. See? It's a bad tea. But actually, the, the point of that line, people didn't say that. Because somehow, when you transcend, your, the, the, the being imprisoned within a sense of your intrinsically identifiable or your intrinsic identity self, which is just you, which is different from everybody else, in a way isolated from and alienated from everybody else, worried about how the other people are going to come eat me, they're going to come do something to me, they're oh, the sickness is going to come get me, die. You know, the problematic nature of the relationship of the real me apart from the real other, everything else. Somehow in transcending that and in realizing that the me is just some total interconnection with it, then a, a plane, the plane within everything else that is all interconnectedness is experienced as the bliss of freedom. The, like a total transcending, melting, you know, blissful bliss. And, and uh, the, those kind of like people, they have a big green on their face. And Buddha, you know, the general knows he's like, sometimes in some cultures, you see certain Buddhas like the samurai Buddha, they look a little grumpy because they, they want to look like the big four samurai. You know, right? <laughs> like, slightly grumpy of Buddha. But in the actual Buddhas, when they, in India, they have very sweet, kind of great smile. Smile of satisfaction and pleasure and joy because they realize the world is great. It's fantastic. You know, the, the great mother, she's blissful herself. She, where, where, where is the source of her creativity? It's bliss. And everybody's creative when you're blissful. You know that yourself. I even prove it with a commercial. Because I know everybody wants to tell me something like that. Have you ever seen the Zoloft commercial? No? No, well, you don't watch that. <laughs> well, there's a commercial of a tranquilizer called Zoloft. Right, which is, uh, you know, it's a prescription, but they make people run to the doctor to get into these horrible drug ads that they do. And what it is, is a lady in a suburban kitchen, and the dog is making a mess, and the baby has thrown its food on the floor, and the husband, and she's burning a waffle, it's smoking, and the other person is an awful peanut, rice, cheese, rice, and it's smoking. The husband is frankly wanting his call. She's at her wit's end. She just, you know, she's trying. Then the wind, then the camera focuses on the window, which looks out on a field in the springtime. And there's yellow flowers. And then the yellow flowers detach from their stalk and they go in the air and they make the word Zolo. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get the idea from C Ted, you come back in the scene, she took one. And she's feeling good. She's feeling a little zinc. <coughs> Mood has been altered. And bam, dog, out, kid, eat your parts. Husband, get your own place off. And let's have another car. In other words, she's feeling better, so there's no off. Right? All those things that she couldn't be grateful about that were overwhelming her disappeared. And she's just, she's mighty. Yes. So she feels and you know that yourself. You know those triple axles they do with those skaters? <laughs> the ones who win are happy. <laughs> the ones who fall on their butt are like worried about getting built to do it. Ah, and then crash. <laughs> Terrible when they have two to the tip all the eyes. But the ones who do it are ecstatic. So we all know that. And we all know that in our own experience. So apparently, I just want to say that to encourage it, because we don't want to worry that. You know, when we met the green mother, we might be submerged in a mud pie. You know, <laughs> because reality could be bad. Not only that, but the world's religions, including some types of Buddhism, they thrive on frightening people. I, like, I remember a story somebody told me they were in Tibet and looking for the abbot of a monastery, the ancient Tibet, long before the communists got there. 
it's in some in travels to come and they want they wanted to see that abbot. They said, Where's the abbot? And then one of the monks said, Oh, he's in town. What's he doing there? Oh, he's terrorizing the people. They said. <laughs> he's frightening the people. Well, of course you see that to run the monastery they go and say, Oh, you're gonna suffer, you know. No, you're gonna go to what the Christians they say you're gonna go to hell, you know, that they have all these terrifying things to people to make them subscribe to the religion, right? So we have a kind of attitude that that reality might not be good, don't we? The people, the scientists who threw out uh, in the Enlightenment, European Enlightenment, which was actually had its good side, but anyway, in the 17th, 18th century, uh, they were throwing out those hell and bird, hellfire like preaching people. Right? So, they, so to them, nothing, of course, nothing is really bad, they were thinking, but actually, nothing, of course, is a, a highly to be desired. We want nothing when we want to fall asleep, when we want anesthesia, when we're having a tooth pulled, we definitely want nothing. <laughs> nothing is not scary at all. It's a big escape place. You know. But anyway, they, they, they did that. So I just wanted to add that, that, that the experience of the universe in a state of total oneness and total, total freedom is bliss. And uh, that bliss is nirvana, or the Buddha, Buddha something, it's nirvana, meaning the extinguishing of any suffering. You know, the extinction of suffering, not of life, but of suffering. And, uh, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a very hard thing for us to think in our Western culture. Those of us from a Western culture, we are taught. And the Eastern culture too, a lot of them, that, that life is tough if you don't have some God or somebody to get you out of it. The idea that life itself, if you understand it, is really great. And wisdom, being one with the great mother is bliss. Ignorance is suffering. Ignorance is the cause of suffering. Failure to understand your actual nature, it will make you suffer because it makes you think, I'm really separate from this vast huge universe. And if you think you are separate from the vast huge universe and you're really, really you, so you're absolutely different and it's really other than you, so it's absolutely other than you, then it's basically a situation of you versus the universe, and guess who will win that one? <laughs> we are now witnessing, all of us, we're in the 45th day of witnessing a person who thought they would be in control of the universe if they only finally moved into public housing. <laughs> in the White House. And they are like completely beset because the universe is not actually conforming to their desire of <laughs> what it might be and they are something completely nuts. We have to be very compassionate about it. I know it's hard. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the, the thing. And then I do want to say now, back but in relation to what you were saying in the overview of Isa, I'd like to say one thing. I want to recommend to everyone in, for future study a work by um, someone called Maria Jimbutas, G-Y-M-B-U-T-A-S, which is Lithuanian, and I think it's pronounced Jimbutas. She passed away some time back. She was an archaeologist, and it's a book called The Civilization of the Gods. And it has a popularized form by another author called, uh, by Rihanna Eisler, E-I-S-L-E-R, which is called uh, The Chalice and the Blade. And she discovered as an archaeologist that in the Danube, which was the breadbasket of Europe, in the very, very prehistoric time, um, there were 90,000 years of, she argues, from the, 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 the archaeological you know, studies that she presided over for decades, that it was matrilineal, if not matriarchal society. And goddess, the mother earth goddess was the, the mother goddess was the main goddess. And there was no much violence. There were few smashed skulls, few weapons, cities seem not to have been fortified. And it seems to have gone on for 90,000 years, about 10,000 years ago, the boys showed up from the Central Asian steppe all with their horses and chariots and things and started beating everybody up. And then and the rest we know about, that's our history. And the Indians, uh, the Mahindra Daro, what they call civilization, in the Harappan Valley, 
um, the Sumerians you mentioned, the Chinese, they all have, in their case, sort of legends, although lately archaeologists are beginning to uncover similar, throughout Eurasia at least, female dominated uh, societies, or at least certainly equal, that were much less violent, that were relatively peaceful, etc., and that therefore our history, our experience of history that we're taught is the is a, like universal history of constant violence, may, which is male dominated, you know, is, is maybe not the mainstream of things. And so those two books will give you a sort of a shifting of the notion of history that I think would be very, very empowering and helpful to this whole It seems to have been the Well, Brianna Eisler has a wonderful organization called She's in California where people are and uh, here's Jerry Brown, uh, called the Partnership, she looks forward to what she calls a Partnership Society. So for her, sort of the new thing will be when male and female are equal. It just isn't going back to female dominated, and it certainly isn't doing male dominated. It's sort of the equality, what she calls a Partnership Society. She has a whole thing about it, and you'll find interesting. Rihanna Eisler, she's the right friend in the LA. Okay, so so that's uh, that's my thought. So, and uh, and yeah, that yeah, and, and relating to which, let me find one final bit of that thought. If you do discover that reality is the arena, if you were to have such an experience, and um, it seemed to you extremely realistic as it did to our look at this the sutra, and many millions of people said. Um, then you would feel really happy yourself. But since you're, this is based on knowledge and not just a kind of uh, sort of going into a separate state, it's a knowledge from being one with the actual state of everything, then you would not miss the fact that a lot of other beings who you feel one with, and you see them as completely cool, because their reality is also already completely cool. Everything is already there and perfect. But then you would not ignore the fact that they don't feel like that, because they don't know their reality. So then that's where they say wisdom becomes compassion. Compassion is defined as finding the suffering of others, or if you're being compassionate toward yourself, finding the suffering of yourself, intolerable. Compassion means that you, you know, like, we all compassion with our own sense organs. You know, I put my hand on a hot pot, I remove it immediately, or we'll try to put some sound on it, 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 it glittered a little. Because that means I'm compassionate to my hand, I find my suffering intolerable. So, if you really felt one with all beings, they are suffering with seeming power. Even if you don't see their suffering is as real as their true condition of being part of a great, a great free physical reality. So you sort of see them in a very, and this is complicated, so I won't go into more detail now, but you have a kind of almost double vision where it's like a great doctor, a great healer. A great healer will see the basic strength and health of the patient, and then they'll see what's going wrong at the same time. So then they sort of will know how to maneuver, get rid of what's going wrong, and bring out the basic immunity and the basic, you know, like the great one. The bad doctor will either not notice, you know, anything, he will get fine to buy, you know, you don't need an insurance. Or the bad doctor will say, oh, you're just a disease. Oh, I can work with that disease. And then they'll only see the disease. They don't see the health of so the Buddha has such a view, an enlightened being, Mr. or Mrs. the Buddha, has such a view. Great, great mother that She sees her children as completely all right at her breast, you know, like, like sustained by the milk of her love. But then she knows that they are having like colic or something. She knows how to 
sense of what we call the consensual reality of our materialist culture that we are in, we are raised in, you know, science classes, I mean, you know, I don't mean church or whatever, I mean science classes. It is that we are material entities and what count, what matters is matter, right? The other stuff doesn't matter. And you don't really have a mind or uh, you just have a brain that makes you think you have a mind. You know, and that's, you know, MIT, Harvard, that old time, Stanford, that old time. And we sort of assimilate that worldview. So when we sleep, we go in a darkened room, silent room, and we sort of slip away. And, um, and then we wake up really refreshed. But we have the idea as we sink into unconsciousness, which we, we're not afraid of, we want to be unconscious, right? Because that's how we're going to sleep. That we're going into this sort of dark space. And in a way, we are ratifying we're sort of having an experience of becoming nothingness. We habitually have that idea. I, you know, I, I want to be nothing. If someone's really overtired, you have exams, you're up for three days, you're taking no-nos or whatever, and then I just want to be wiped out. I want to wipe out. Okay, right? That's, the, you, that's what we say when we go to sleep. So at Menla, we don't do that. We think about the process of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, where when you when you shut down your consciousness's focus on your five senses, waking senses, and you even shut down your consciousness's thinking process, which is your inner sense, and you stop thinking, you know, cow cheap or whatever, say that gate, gate, even gone, gone, very gone, very super gone, sleep swaha, you know, <laughs> you would say, body swaha. So at that time, they say you go to a place of moonlight, and then there's a little warmth, like a sunlight space. Then you hit a dark space. But you don't stay in the dark space. Beneath the dark space, and normally we don't encounter it, is a space they call clear light. Or more accurately, I would say transparency like pure glass, pure crystal, pure diamond. And that is the space of the sort of deepest nature of the Great Mother, Bhagavati Prajnaparamita, of emptiness, indivisible from relativity. It is this space of infinite energy that is so powerful and so inexhaustible that it actually doesn't need to do a thing because everything is already done at that, in that plane. It's all fine. And yet it's, a, it's an inexhaustible well of energy. So that any being that feels the need for any kind of energy, that was super replenishment or healing or whatever, can draw infinitely without exhausting this infinite energy, if you follow me. But infinite energy wouldn't be running around like, I'm going to do something. I'm gonna, because everything's already done, because it's infinite. Right? You know, there's a concept in quantum in quantum theorization, they call the zero quantum point vacuum field of infinite energy. They, they have a thing like that. But never mind. 
So it may be it's discovering the same thing. My point is, in your sleep yoga, even though you, what you're seeking is a state of dark quiescence, aim yourself, think to yourself, obviously I'm not lying to eight hours or however many hours in nothingness, or I wouldn't feel the slightest bit refreshed or restored in the morning. My the cells of my body that my mind is paying no attention to for these eight hours are lying in this bed, this field of infinite energy. And the energy is replenishing every kind of need in those cells. So I'm sleeping in the clear light. And, uh, and you could even connect it to the Great Mother, you could say, my, my head is in the lap of the Great Mother, where there's this infinite nurture. And that's what's happening in sleep. But since I can't really, I, my mind is not open to such a grand vision, I'm just thinking I'm kind of in, in a dark corner, quiet in my bed, in my pillow, in a nice quiet room, hopefully. Okay, that's, that's middle of sleep yoga. Sleep in the clear light. Don't sleep in the dark nothingness. Okay? Thank you, Justin. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. This video was brought to you in part with the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit Tibet House U.S., including invites to special trips to study Buddhism up close and personal with Robert Thurman during his annual geographic expedition trips. Trips in 2018 include Mongolia and Bhutan. To learn more, visit BobThurman.com.